Hey, you're back. This is Paul Riappel. Thank you for joining me. Episode five. Today, I've got, this is good, I've got John Harris, Riappel bass player for, you know, four decades. That's right. Let's get going. Welcome back to the Riappel Room. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Riappel Room. Today, my guest, the one and only bass player extraordinaire, Riappel band member for, I don't know, 38 years? Through uh, the, some, yeah, something like that, right, John? Yeah, no, it, it was 38 years. Yeah, yes, through yeah. the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, beyond. I'm talking about John Harris. Thank you, John, for joining me in the Riopel room. Oh, my pleasure. How are you today? I'm doing well, Paul. How about you? I'm doing all right. These crazy times we're living in. Yep, they sure are. So, I'll say that. Yes. So let's talk about stuff. Let's let's first we're gonna go back. And this is I take everyone back when we start this show. So get ready. Here we go. Oh. 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 And now we're back. Yikes. <laughs> So, John, tell me the beginning. Tell me, first of all, what, when did you first start playing? When, when did music become something that had to be a part of your life? And what was your instrument? started quite early, actually. Uh, my great aunt started giving me piano lessons at the age of five. Okay. And uh, then I picked up guitar at seven. My, my aunt bought me a guitar, and I... I taught myself to play that off of old Burl Ives records that I loved to listen to as a kid. And I played that all the way through high school, continued with piano lessons up until the age of nine, at which point I discovered sports and girls, and unfortunately the keyboard fell by the wayside. Right. Which I to, which I to this day regret. Uh-huh. But, but nevertheless, I carried on with a guitar, uh, Played through high school, just parties and stuff, Kingston Trio, stuff like that. And then uh, when I got in college, once I heard Elvis, that was it. I took that guitar and started playing Elvis songs and other rock and roll songs. And, right, right. Uh, wh while I was at UCLA, I, my friend and uh, fraternity brother, uh, Mike McDonald, and I started a band. Now, we've got to stop here because we've got several Mike McDonald's going on here. Right. There's Laurie's brother, Mike McDonald. Yes. There's the Mike McDonald of Doobie Brothers fame. Wait, who? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, and then my friend, Mike McDonald. So we're, we're talking about John's friend, Mike McDonald. Right. And yeah, we started a band. We were just playing fraternity parties and things like that. And uh, one summer we decided, since the frat parties had dried up, we auditioned for some clubs. We named our band The Regents, and we got caught up in this whole Hollywood scene on Sunset Strip. This is when the doors were at the Whiskey of Go-Go. Right, so like six, mid the, six, basically 66, somewhere in there? It was 65, actually. Right, yeah. okay. Summer, summer of 65. Okay. Yeah, and Buffalo Springfield at Pandora's Box, and the birds at the crescendo, and we were right up there on the Sunset Strip. We became the house band at Ciro's, uh, which at that time they turned into a teenage nightclub, and we ended up opening for anybody who was big at the time, Sonny and Cher, Love and Spoonful. Wow. All, all the big acts. And in addition to that, we ended up being the studio band on the dating game for the first 13 weeks. So, How was yeah, that? We, what was that like? It was pretty crazy. We'd go in and tape and tape, uh, record the songs because we we didn't. Nobody ever played live on TV back then. You, you recorded everything first and then right. you lip synced. Oh, to so it. you lip. So even with the stu the studio audience, you just lip synced to the the opening. right. Oh, okay. Well, 
Yeah, well, we would, we would uh, before the show, warm up the audience live, but as the ah. show was going on, we would just lip sync. But, you know, Jim Lang was the host. Right. We had Go-Go, we had Go-Go Girls dancing. And, uh, anyway, it was pretty wild. And then after that band disbanded, uh, I kept playing with two of the members, Mike McDonald, who played guitar, mm-hmm. and drummer Craig Boyd. And we ended up working clubs. We were playing clubs four or five nights a week, four sets a night. We were working quite a bit. And during that time, a fellow named Rich Tillis uh, heard us play, and he he was Sly Stone's engineer at the time. Right. And was looking into getting into producing bands of his own, so he cut a couple of demos on us. And he was also one of the engineers on Jerry's second album. Right. And that's basically how I got introduced to Jerry, was through Rich. Uh, Jim Hall had quit the band by then, and Jerry needed a bass player. Uh, it was kind of in the middle of recording the second album. and Which is I why there's a couple bass players on that album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more than one. Yes. Yeah, I think there's three, actually. There's you, Jim Hall, and uh, John Ziegler was the uh, third one. That's correct. Yeah, yeah that's correct. So anyway, Rich calls me the one morning and goes, you want to come in and play on some records? I got this friend Jerry Riopelle, and he, he needs a bass player on some tunes. And I said, well, fine. I said, I got a gig tonight, though. I'm playing for like till 1.30. And he goes, oh, that's not a problem. Our st- we're recording from 12 midnight to 6 in the morning. Huh. So <laughs> so come on in after your gig. So <laughs> ah, The rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> So uh, a rumor went around, is going around, uh, Dave mentioned it, that during this first recording session, I was on acid. Okay. <laughs> so kind of have to qualify this rumor because you have to realize I had never met Jerry. Right. I had never, I had never heard any of his music. And, uh, you know, to most, this would be like, what, is this guy crazy? Right, it's right. Like, He's like going into this, basically auditioning for this guy on the spot, yeah. and he's gonna and he's gonna drop acid, right? You know, what's up with that? <laughs> yeah, I but, guess I didn't know that there was no that this was kind of just a a way to get someone in to fil- finish the record. We needed a bass player, so let's bring in this guy yeah. John Harris that I know. Is yeah, that, that was it. That yeah. was it. Yeah. Okay. But what you have to realize is playing clubs five nights a week, four sets a night, and sometimes, why we ever did this, I have no idea, we would play regular hours and then play after hours, too. We'd play till one thirty, take a half-hour break, and, and play after hours. Right. Well, in order to get through that, we'd all drop acid. Right, you know? right, right. It, it, it was just something we did. It yeah. wasn't like, it wasn't, uh, you know, if we wanted to stay up all night and have a good time, that's what we did. Right. And, of course, so, we got to remember, the year was 71, 72? 1972. Yeah, right. And so, you know, for me, it was a no-brainer. I, I needed to go into the studio, and, you know, probably 2, two o'clock in the morning by the time I got there and mm-hmm. be awake and alert and have a good time. So I dropped acid. Of course. Yeah, it was like... <laughs> That's that's what in 1972. That's what that's what you did. Right, right, right. And then, so this club was out in uh, Pomona, almost. So I left the club at about 1:30 and dropped some acid, so it had plenty of time <laughs> to take to take effect by the time I got to the record plant. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah. By the time I got to the record plant, I was on another planet. Yeah, basically, basically. You're yeah. on record planet. <laughs> record yes, record. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what was your first task? What was the, the, what did they give you? Was it Silver Dollar, the first thing you had to attempt? Or? It was Silver Dollar, and that was what was pretty amazing, because I just went in and I got introduced to Jerry. And, right. Uh, he, he didn't give me any chart or anything. He, he plugged my bass directly into the board. Rich Tillis was there. Uh-huh. And he said, okay, here's the first song. And just ran the tape. Wow. So uh, probably three times through, by the fourth time, I pretty much had a part down. And, yeah. And we recorded it and then uh, went on to I'll Be Glad to Take the Blame. Okay. 
same thing, three or four passes, and uh, pretty much had it. Then we might have had to go back and punch in a few clams or something. But right. But, but basically, uh, you know, it, it went it went very well. And uh, I think the last one I did that night was uh, no, no expectations. No expectations, uh, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so after that, I. He must have been happy because Jerry called me back a few days later to play on Rubber Band Man with Jerry Gibson. Well, he he <laughs> he saw something and he heard something, so yeah, obviously he knew what he yeah. was. He, both of you guys, he hit it off and it worked. So you played on that album. That was 1972, and then and then he got a deal a couple of years later, and that was Saving Grace. And you played on part of the, You played on half of that album. Well, you know what happened was. Uh, we did a couple of gigs after that. The first live gig I did with him was opening for Poco at the Santa Monica Civic. And then we did a few, you know, I think we might have done the Palomino, a couple of clubs in right. San Diego. and Maybe Troubadour. And, yeah, Troubadour. And, and in the meantime, we were rehearsing at Freddie Papalardo's house out in the valley. Mm -hmm. And we practiced a lot out there. And we rehearsed a lot. Basically, the songs that became part of the Devonshire sessions. Right, right. Which led to uh, Jerry shopping those sessions and getting a deal with Dunhill for uh, That's right. For Saving Grace. So those those Devonshire sessions kind of formed the, the foundation of, of Saving Grace. Right, and that's, and, uh, yeah, that was the beginning. So you played on those, and then, then when they had the, to complete the album, all the other songs they brought in. Um, I guess Wilton Felder and Jim Gordon, but you actually got to play with Jim Gordon on something. I did. It was amazing. I mean, what an honor to get to play yeah, with right. him. Yeah, right. I played with him on Naomi's song. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I my earliest memories of the studio were during was Saving Grace, and that, mostly the 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 album release party that they had in Studio A at the at the completion of of Saving Grace. I, I definitely remember that. I remember meeting Jason. There yeah. during that time too, he was taking a nap in the this like oh. thing that was like a closet. It seemed I don't know. He was just like <laughs> asleep <laughs> at, yeah. at Sound City. Yeah, yeah. He still takes naps in closets. Okay, <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> well, you know, yeah. whatever works, right? Yeah. So, well, anyway, John, before we move forward, let's play a song. Let's go. Let's do one of the songs from the Saving Grace album. This is one. Uh, your bass is you have great bass part on it um great song it's called you and i and uh do you mind if we take a listen no it's one of my favorites as well great well, let's listen to it here it is you and i with john on the bass <laughs>
great song it is what a great sounding record right yeah uh, yeah yeah and that's freddie yeah. on drums yeah freddie yeah um, the guy was amazing um, yeah uh, and uh yeah we rehearsed all of that at his, at his house out in the valley well i also remember you guys rehearsing blues on my table in our garage uh over on vista that, street yeah that too yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of that going on yeah. yeah. So, what do you, do you recall your first impression of Jerry? Like the, when you like when you came to that first session, were you did you think cool right away? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you were obviously under the influence, love, you could say, or I don't. Yeah. Know, but did that? I, I love. Yeah, no, I love the songs. Yeah, that's yeah. What, that's what, that's what first drew me. It's yeah, yeah. The songs and the fact that uh, that he liked. Uh, you know, a lot of percussive, uh, you know, types of rhythms and and uh, different rhythms and things. Cause well, I, yeah, he did start I, out as a drummer, so that's probably... Yeah, that exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I, t- I took to that immediately. That's cool. Yeah, yeah you you and Plen are absolutely the heart of that reappel sound. I mean, if for all you f- people out there, if you went to a, a reappel concert... Throughout the seventies, eighties, nineties, John is the bass player, and uh, you guys really had a thing. You and Plen complemented each other. The inner, the interplay with the, the the parts, right? I mean, you guys obviously had to work on worked on that stuff because it was so great. Yeah, well, that's that was one of the wonderful things about working with Jerry is he he allowed us to become part of the creative process. You know, a lot a lot of 
singers and songwriters, you'd walk in and they'd hand you a chart or they'd say, okay, you play this and you play that. And Jerry was like so receptive to you know all of our ideas and welcomed them. Yeah, and we we had the freedom to create our own our own parts. And of course, during that time, as you just mentioned, we would play off each other. David hears something that I played, or I'd hear something that he played, or I'd pick up on. Uh, something Jerry played on the keyboard, which is kind of what I did on you and I to to come up with that bass part. That was so, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful part. I love it. But but that that was the amazing thing about working with Jerry was how he he welcomed our input and he included us in in the creative process, and it was just a blessing to be a part of that. Great. So obviously, the crazy phenomenon that was Arizona. Do you remember your first? trip out there with the the reappel band and what that was like it's like whoa we, all of a sudden we're like superstars <laughs> yeah yeah well actually the beginning of that first trip was i remember in your conversation with david jenkins you guys talked about one of the first shows you went to you rode out there in, in a motor home that we had rented right well that first gig uh, we found out that we had this, uh, this uh, we were opening for David Bomberg in Phoenix, which was very exciting and awesome, except none of us had a car that would make it past San Bernardino, <laughs> right. much, much less to Phoenix, Arizona. Mm-hmm. So we took the Greyhound. Oh, no, really? I don't that think I our, knew that. That was our first mode of transportation to to Arizona, and I think... Uh, Dave and a couple of other people, Jerry Gibson as well, and myself, plus a couple of other people, we had a band we were playing like high school parties and stuff like that. And we had a gig that night that ended at about 10. So we took the midnight Greyhound from the bus station in LA to Phoenix. I think there's a song in there somewhere. I think so. (laughs) And it arrived at 7 in the morning in Phoenix, Arizona. And the celebrity crew, some of the celebrity crew members were there to meet us. And uh, I just remember them in retrospect saying, we could not believe this motley crew that got off this Greyhound <laughs> with, the, with this bar band equipment. Right, right. And, and uh, so, yeah, that's how we got there. And then... Uh, I think Dave talked about this too, but I, I, you just can't talk about it enough. We had no idea what to expect. So we went in, did our little sound check, time for the show, nice crowd in there. Oh, this is great. Lit into to living the life. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that, the place erupted. Wow. It went nuts. And we were like flabbergasted. Right, right. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. What? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was the beginning. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember. The thing is, I know we came by Greyhound. I don't remember how we got back. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, well, my but, first but trip it, out there, I remember we all met at the Hill House. Do you remember that? That was a place Jerry and Dave were sharing to write songs and stuff. Yeah, and we mm-hmm. all we packed in one of the vans was Jerry Gibson's van, no yeah. windows. It was a freight van with no, yeah. <laughs> just a one sliding door, no seats, just the front, you know, front driver's seat and the passenger seat, and and I, there may have been another van, but I just remember everyone, the, all the equipment was at the bottom of this van, the floor, and then a mattress on top of that, and everyone yeah. piled in, the ki- yeah, all the that- kids and the band, yeah. That was our second mode of transportation. Right, right. Uh, Moving up in the world. <laughs> yeah, a mattress on top of the equipment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. That, that went on for a year or so. And yeah. Then, uh, and then fortunately, uh, as our popularity increased in Arizona, which happened very quickly. Yeah, it did. Uh, yeah, uh, we were able to uh, rent an equipment van and two guys to drive it and mm-hmm. handle the equipment. And then we all 
I rode in the comfort of a motor home, but we kind of had we kind of had to work our way up to that. Yeah. Right, and then there were some. Did you guys go by train ever, or was that just the the my the me, my mom and dad, and Angela? Probably we took a train mm-hmm. there once. Yeah, no, we never went yeah. by train. Yeah, it was either motor home or airplane. Yeah, the motor home trips were fun though. They were a lot of fun. They were they, they were awesome. Yeah, yeah. And you knew your. I remember you knew your way really well. I remember you saying. You knew, like, you knew everything about Blythe. <laughs> I don't know if that's something to be proud of. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember, like, Love Can Exit. To this day, I get off on Love Can Exit, and I just remember you. You were always like, okay, we got to stop at Love Can. This is like in the 70s, and that kind of became the stop. Uh, yeah. The halfway point, or just, you know. Yeah, well, the... the, the uh... 10 didn't go all the way through to Phoenix. That, right. That, Back then, yes, it didn't. You're yeah, right. yeah, you you bailed it like Buckeye or someplace and had to take uh, surface streets. Right. And I, yeah, I remember that. The first trip, what, the first time I went was 75 when uh, Hobo Grin opened the show. So Tammy and George were on that trip. Yeah. Um, and uh, we left late at night again, just like your Greyhound excursion. We left at like 1030 at night from the Hill House. And we arrived like five in the morning. I just remember bugs hitting the windshield. The sun was coming up and this long surface street drive way was like, wait, we got off the freeway. Why are we driving another hour? <laughs> so, yeah. You know, to the the reason for that late departure was it was summertime and it was right. It was still uh, 98 degrees in Arizona at one in the morning. So we uh, and of course uh, we had no air conditioning at that point, so uh, yeah, we, we we drove in the in the evening to try to beat the heat. Or some crazy days. You had we had talked earlier, uh, and you had mentioned uh, obvious. I mean, obviously, the Phoenix gigs were just amazing. You have fond memories of some of the smaller gigs. You said, and there's, I, "I'm telling you, there's nothing like playing a, a, a nightclub or, right. or a bar. Just the intimacy of it. Pawnbroker, yeah, yeah, uh, and there's." You know, bars are bars, clubs are clubs, but there's some that are just like no other. Right. And, and the pawnbroker was one of those. And uh, yeah, uh, just the the friends that we made there. Uh, we Bob Meehan was actually the one that got us uh, to start playing there because he right. he played there a lot, and we had many wonderful concerts there with uh, with him opening for us. I, yes, he opened up the Celebrity Theater and as a matter of fact there's a video of that show and that was one that was when the audience went absolutely nuts <laughs> all the girls jumping on the stage <laughs> throughout the show. Yeah, it was it was yeah. kind of frightening actually. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. And then even before that there was this club in San Diego called Funky Quarters. Uh-huh. And uh, this was kind of the in between the uh, second album and Saving Grace, one of the places we played. And it was it was an, uh, an amazing place. We opened there for Jim Croce once. And oh wow! Also, and also for John Lee Hooker. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, later on down the road, the Billy Up Tavern. Was right. Just right. awesome place to play. So. And did you make the trip over to Amsterdam? Cause the, because lo, maybe a lot of people don't know that Amsterdam was a huge following as well, but you just didn't go there that often. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we, I was there. Yeah. 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 So that was like, that was similar to Phoenix, actually. Uh huh. Yeah. And we, uh, that was the trip where we opened for Emmy Lou Harris. Yeah. And That's the Hot right. Band. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And we, and we played in London as well uh, after was it, that. Was that the same tour, or was that separate? No, we went. We played in Amsterdam first, mm-hmm. and then uh, flew from Amsterdam over to London and, and played a concert there. Okay. And you know, uh, James Burton, a famous guitar player, played with uh, Ricky Nelson and Elvis. And right, right. Big session player. He he was in the Hot Band, and I think in. In London, more people came to see James Burton than they did to see either us or Amy Lou Harris. Oh, really? Wow. Because he, he got a huge, after every solo, he almost got a standing ovation. So huh. that was that was a, a memorable experience as well. That's cool. And, of course, Rodney Crowell's in that band. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The uh, keyboard player, Lindy Harden, the keyboard player from the Crickets. Oh, 
he played on the little bit at a time album also. Yeah. He, yeah. I think on yes, over and did. over. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, so let's move moving a little forward. There's a song. I, and as far as I know, it's the only co-write between you and Jerry that was published. And that's on the dangerous stranger album. And it's a uh-huh. beautiful song called man and a woman. You want it? So what I know is that you kind of were just had this riff and Jerry heard it one day and was like, whoa, I like that. I don't know. Tell the story. How did that come about? How did Man and Woman evolve? Well, at this, yeah, at this point, we were rehearsing in a little place out in, off of Lancashire, a little rehearsal hall that we had for quite a while, actually. And uh, I was out there, I don't know, a little early, and I was just kind of playing around with a two-note little bass melody just uh, to kind of pass the time till rehearsal got going. And Jerry started listening, and he said, what's that? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'm just kind of messing around with this little two-note, you know, bass kind of harmony, melody kind of thing going on. He goes, wait a minute. And he got out his little cassette player and, and recorded it. Like, next rehearsal, he comes back with the completed song. We're using that as the melody for the for the verses. Wow. And uh, once again, you know, he had the chords, and uh, basically uh, he wrote the bridge to it. Right. And uh, we just kind of all messed around and came up with other parts to the other parts of the song. And, and that bass line became the introduction. I, it was used again. Under uh, the third verse, I believe, I kind of uh-huh. played the melody along with the vocal, and then uh, we ended the song with uh, with it as well. Great, beautiful song. And by the way, you know the tribute we just did. Susan Cowsill, who sang it at the tribute, absolutely fell in love with that song, and and just oh, had yeah, to, she was... just like really had to. She really wanted to sing it, and she had she had never heard it before. I kind of uh-huh. it was an idea I had. Oh, this she might. I mean, I knew she was great. She's a great singer. And I thought Promenade and then thought of another one, Man and Woman, and she absolutely fell in love. So it's cool. Yeah, yeah what a thrill that was to get to play that with her. It yeah, was, yeah. It was great. Well, why don't we listen to that one now? Sure. So let's listen to Man and a Woman and co-write here, Jerry and John Harris. Here we go, Man and a Woman.
Pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was just wonderful that uh, that Jerry recognized that the possibilities that that melody suggested, yeah, and, and, yeah, and really and really took it to a wonderful spot. Exactly, and I believe the the that was recorded at the aforementioned Mike McDonald's studio, right? Yeah, Mike. After yeah, yeah after uh, Mike got into recording, uh, as a matter of fact, he. Had a garage studio. Yes. In Westwood, and we actually recorded the Dangerous Stranger and Juicy Talk in that right. garage studio. And then. And by the way, The Motion recorded their demo tape there. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can't forget that. No, can't leave that out. No. And then uh, he eventually, his business grew to the point to where he moved up to Hollywood and had a, you know, a bigger. Studio, and we ended up recording the 1994 Jerry Riopo CD there that George Knopfel produced. We recorded that. At, right. Oh, that's at Mike's studio that's right. in Hollywood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's great. I do, I'm so, curious. Do you still talk to Mike? I do. Yeah. Good. Yeah. He uh, he actually they bought a, a huge former mansion in the mid LA and turned it into a studio and. He now does television and motion picture soundtracks. Oh wow! Look at that, and, and, and has become quite uh, well known for it. So, uh, so yeah, move so over I, the other Michael McDonald. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he was always a great guy. I really liked him. As a matter of fact, next time you talk to him, please tell him I said hello. I certainly yeah, will. Really like yeah. Mike. He was a nice yeah. guy. Yeah, a good friend of mine for a long time. Yeah, cool. Um. So I have a question, and I know other people are wondering this. Like, so people may know when they saw the band perform during Red Ball Texas Flyer, you play with a stick, bait. You play, yeah. but you bounce the stick off the strings. And I know yeah. that's kind of been done before, but what made? Because I, I think the you didn't actually play the bass on the actual studio record. That was a session guy, I think. Yeah. And he kind of slapped the. I don't think he played with a stick on that track. But he kind of slapped the bass with his hand. Well, yeah, he was Roger Bush was that guy's name. Yeah, he was playing a stand-up bass. It wasn't electric. It was stand-up. Right, that's and, right. Yes. And he was slapping it hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we were trying to figure, well, how can we kind of get that sound uh, live? You know, mm-hmm. when because I could I couldn't play a stand-up bass, but uh, uh-huh. so uh, somehow we came up with the idea. Well, why don't you try a drumstick? So uh, that's that's how that started. You were awfully good at that, though. I mean, did you did you pick it up on it right away? You could just playing it with a stick. Yeah, yeah. Well, it took some practice. Yeah, and, uh, it, it it wasn't easy. I kind of had to contort my arm and my hand in order to right, right, in order to do it. But it was highly successful live. I mean, I got to the point to where they were shining a spotlight on my hand. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of became it kind of became a stage thing. Yeah, everyone loved that. Yeah. So, John, anything? Any? What? What do you got going on these days? I know you were a teacher for a while, weren't you? Or are you still doing that? Or no, I re- I retired in two thousand okay. two thousand nine. You know, okay. I was I was fortunate that uh, you know, I, thanks to Jerry and the Arizona success and the other places that we played, I was able to make a living. Yeah. Play, playing music till around 1985. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and even though we still continued to play after that, I f- figured, well, it's time for me to get a 
straight job here. Get a real job? A, I need to get a real <laughs> job. Yeah. yeah. And so I was fortunate that uh, I already had a college degree. You know? Oh, great. Yeah. At that time in L.A., uh, they, there was a teacher shortage, so they made it very easy for me to uh, go into teaching. They gave me an emergency credential, and I, I taught uh, full-time for, th- for the first three years while I was getting my credential. And then uh, that continued till uh, I started in 1987, full-time teacher at 66th Street School in South L.A. Hmm. And uh, continued there till 2009. And, and did you teach something teacher. specific or just general? I taught fifth grade, so I taught everything. Everything, you know? okay. Yeah. So, so after I retired, uh, we moved up here to the Central Coast and Having a wonderful time. Great. There's one more song that we we touched on a little bit, but I think we should listen to it because everyone loves this song. And the the arrangement, the 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 evolution of this song from being written on a, an accordion to <laughs> basically a yeah. masterpiece as far as I'm concerned. From yeah. the Saving Grace album, it's called Blues on My Table. Your yep. bass playing on it is beautiful. You're playing a fretless bass on this one. Yep. And uh, do you still have that bass? I do. You do. I still have it. And you took the frets off of it. Was it always a fretless bass? I seem to remember you what, saying you took the frets off. Well, what happened? What happened was the frets got worn down to where they. And this was the bass I was playing nightclubs for five years, five nights a week, four sets a night. So the frets got worn down. Well, at the time, I couldn't afford to have a fret job done. Right. So the tech at Westwood Music said, well, why don't I just take them off and fill in the cracks? I can give you a good deal on that. Yeah. So I said, sure. So that's how... Uh, and that's a jazz bass, yeah? It's a 1965 Fender jazz bass, which cool. I still have. Yeah. So, yeah, I, so Blues on My Table, uh, and this is one that you guys spent a lot of time working on the arrangement. I remember <laughs> in the garage. Oh, yeah. And uh, So it's Freddie on drums, Dave yep. Plant, of course, on guitar, you on bass, and Jerry, of course, on the Wurlitzer piano, and then some, you know, uh, there's an accordion there, I guess, is Nick DeCaro, would that be him? That I be- yeah, I believe so, yeah. Anyway, let's listen to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let's just listen to it. It's Blues on My Table. This be, this was like kind of the first huge airplay in Arizona, and it got airplay in Los Angeles, too. I remember yeah. hearing it on the radio out there. Uh, So let's listen. It's a great track and love it. And here we go. Blues on my table.
Gonna rain in my eyes this morning Got the blues on my table I got the blues on my bed Well, the girl didn't love me All right But she just didn't Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great one. It's it's still uh, it's it's still awesome. Yeah. Yes. As a matter of and sis I don't I think I may have told you this before, but David and David Jenkins and I, every time we hear that song, even if we don't hear that version, we always air guitar your bass part during that solo oh. section. <laughs> always I mean for I don't even know how long I mean since we were kids, we just that Doom, 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 doom. <laughs> That's the, <laughs> we, it's, well, it's, once, it's, you know, once again, Jerry, uh, he came in with the, the line he, he got off of Stuart's accordion and the lyrics and the chords. And I know uh, in the liner notes to the works, he said, you know, this song only had two chords. Right, right. So... The challenge we were faced with was, okay, how do you make a song with two chords? Yeah. You know, in, how do you hold the listener's interest? Uh -huh. So that was our real challenge in putting that song together. And that's why we worked on it so hard and why yeah. it took a while. But it, just listening to all the different little variations and sections and things that we did. And, yeah. You know, we did a lot with addition and subtraction. We'd add in. You know, I, I dropped out on two or three occasions, so it was just basically. Yeah, the dynamics you know, are amazing. You were you yeah. were great at that. You were really great at figuring out how to make something dynamic by dropping out, coming in at the right time, and beautiful. Yeah, yeah I love it. But, well, you know, one of the musicians saying is, "It's more about what you don't play than what, than what you do play." Exactly. So, so. Less is more. Exactly. Yeah. All right, John. Well, anything else? Well, I'd just like to say the other thing I, about that song was, you know, we created what I always thought was a unique blend of uh, country and rock and blues. Right. And some songs, of course, leaned more country. Some were full-on country. Some were kind of more blues. Others were more rock. I thought this one was... Really, the perfect blend of all three. It was. You're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's such a great track. And I and I actually, you know, the the program director at KDKB, Bill Compton, uh -huh. he he, you know, he went nuts about this album, which is why it went into full rotation. And he had little right. stars that he wrote on the back of the the radio copy of the, of all the songs he liked. And this one in particular, he had like eight stars next to it. Like, this, is, um, this is amazing. Yeah. This is an amazing yeah. track. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I would like to assure everybody out there now that I don't drop acid anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay. In case anybody's concerned about my health. Uh, right. Yeah. Now I, I, uh, now I drop an acid. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But um, psh, and and, yeah. and X and X lax. So, uh, right. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think. get old. Don't get old, Paul. It's the pits. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm afraid that's <laughs> happening anyway. You know, as we oh, speak. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you just, just had you just had a birthday. Happy birthday. I did. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
So, John, thank you for joining me today in the Riopel room. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, I just, uh, probably the highlight of my musical career was spent with Jerry. Oh, wow, it's such, so such an honor to, to be a part of his band. So to be able to reminisce with you about it and yeah. talk about these songs is uh, just wonderful. I said this earlier, but the fact is you and Plen were kind of the sound, along with Jerry's obviously his keyboard style and playing, but yeah. you guys definitely were an integral part of that uh, sound. And, uh, and I should mention, we didn't really cover any of the songs he played on today, but Jerry Gibson, you did a, most of those shows in the seventies. Well, all the shows in the seventies. Well, yeah. I guess in Arizona anyway, we're with Jerry Gibson, yeah. who, uh, who was also a great drummer. And of course, Freddie was great too. Um, well, anyway, John, Thanks again, and let's do this again. Yeah, yeah. We, we can all kinds of things we can talk about. Oh, there's so much to talk about. Yes. Yeah. All well, right. Thank you for having me, Paul. And yeah. I look forward to talking with you again. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us in the Reappel Room.